Welcome to the Remarkable Retail Podcast, Season 3, Episode 7. I'm Michael LeBlanc. And I'm Steve Dennis. Well, Steve, we're back with Part 2 of our deep dive into department stores. I've got you on my to myself today, which is great. Uh, and, you know, we're a couple of department store veterans ourselves, so... Uh, you know, talk, we'll be talking to each Department other. Department store dinosaurs. Uh, talking to our audience. Yeah. Well, I was, I don't know about dinosaurs, but we're certainly veterans. Let's just put it that way. We came out, uh, we, we, we came out of the department store sector. So it's part two. Uh, but first, uh, let's jump in to our news of the week. So, uh, lots of interesting things happening. And again, a reminder to the listeners and viewers that we're now weekly, uh, after the summer, we enjoyed our summer, but now weekly, there's so much going on. Really excited to be coming at you weekly. And uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is RH. You know, I, this restoration hardware became RH. They put out some numbers that were just bananas good. Um, and and I even read in their numbers, what, what was like 375% increase in their share price? That doesn't always equate to how yeah. good the business is yeah. performing in the weird, weird world we're in. And And now they're selling like home communities that people are buying sight unseen like talk about rh it's such an interesting business well i mean they are becoming kind of this next generation lifestyle brand they they made the decision six seven years ago to go after a particular set of customers with a particular kind of design aesthetic build these temples to home furnishings uh, that they've been opening and it has worked really really well so far and it is as you said giving them opportunities to to look at some some new things. But if you just look at their core business, it's been on fire for several years now. Uh, the comparisons, yeah, because they're yeah. so physically store dominant, the comparisons to last year were pretty easy. But if you look at it over the last several years, uh, it just continues to be really great sales performance. They're converting it to the bottom line really well, uh, planning to open a bunch more stores. Um, now, they're certainly benefiting from the kind of distorted spending in home. But the flip side, which they talk about in their earnings release, is they've had a lot of supply chain issues. So if they could actually get product uh, the way they normally could get product, you kind of wonder what these numbers would have looked like. Uh, So the road ahead is a little probably choppier for them, both because of supply chain and and probably Mm -hmm. some ebbing in this this home spending. But it's impressive. You know, I think I think for a brand like that, supply chain issues are are probably not as problematic as others because people, you know, they they wait for their order right. and and once they've made the decision, they probably wouldn't cancel it. They're like they're not going to go over to another competitor and and re redo the buys. I would well, I would particularly think. yeah, I think um, I think the big ticket nature of it um, and lots of other companies don't have product either, so it's not. It's not like you've got a ready right. substitute, and if you're redecorating your home or moved into a new home, you're going to furnish it and. Yeah, you're, you're a little bit stuck in, in that respect. Yeah, yeah. Let's stretch our minds now to Lululemon, this side of the border, uh, based uh, based in uh, based in Vancouver. Uh, uh, Calvin uh, McDonald, who uh, I know actually ran a great business at uh, at Loblaw. Uh, he took a turn at Sears as president of Sears yeah, Canada. Sephora, couldn't, I think, also. couldn't fail that. Sephora, yeah, that was his glass gig before Lululemon. Uh, again, you know, probably a business that's benefiting from the COVID era and the kind of lifestyle, but, you know, outpacing everybody. What, what are your thoughts on Lululemon? It, you know, th- this is a bit, I think these are one of these businesses we've talked about before that their strategy of blending digital and physical has been strong for a while. Um, they've invested very smartly. And then the cherry on the Sunday, I guess, is the shift towards athleisure and, and the product categories they're in. But I think even if you yeah. back out yeah. the category spending, I mean, they're certainly gaining share and they're firing on all cylinders. So again, probably a little bit like RH, they're not going to have quite the tailwind from some of the spending um, distortions, mm-hmm. uh, but a beautifully executed yeah business and I, I i think the momentum will continue there and and it seems like to me that they've got some airspace to move i mean they really have just started to address the 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 male side the men's side mm-hmm. of the business they have a male line but they're really 
you know, predominantly female. Uh, and they've bought into what's that company, Mirror, which is that virtual right. uh, thing, right? So, they, you know, stretching the business again, <laughs> uh, not to kill that metaphor, but, you know, stretching the business in different directions, it all seemed to make sense. Well, yeah, the Mirror, the mirror thing was a, was a little bit of a question in, in some of the analysts' takes on their earnings report, because that was a big acquisition that does seem to really fit into this blending of physical and digital world, subscription business, a lot of things that seem pretty attractive. People were pretty excited about when the acquisition was made, but they didn't talk very much about Mirror, which made people a little bit suspicious, but perhaps it's, it's much ado about yeah. nothing. But yeah, they've got a lot of, a lot yeah. of levers to pull going forward. Uh, speaking of levers, uh, let's talk about uh, Amazon. We always seem to talk about Amazon. They've always got something yeah. interesting going on in their business. Um, shop it like you stole it technology coming to Whole Foods. That's, that's a big deal, right? Uh, I, I'm not sure they prefer that branding, but the, uh, what people may know from the Amazon <laughs> Go stores, the walkout technology, I think is what they call it, where, uh, oh, okay. you are checked into the store okay. through your mobile device. And then because of RFID chips, I guess, or tags, uh, you're able to just walk out and it automatically charges the credit card you have on file with them. They are mm. experimenting with this in a bunch of places. The most recent announcement is they're going to put it into a couple of Whole Foods stores. So like we always seem mm. to talk about with Amazon, they experiment with so many things. It's hard to say, oh, they're doing this yeah. in a couple of stores that this has got any big indication of, of what's next. But they definitely mm. seem to be flexing their muscles with the, uh, the walkout technology and, and bringing it to Whole Foods is, is definitely interesting. You know, I was in a, a Sobeys, a Canadian retailer, and they had a smart cart. I don't know if you ever use these smart yeah. carts, which is kind of, you know, similar, right? You put a thing in the cart and you just go. It's really great. The one problem, they ruined it with four words, four words. You know what those four words were? Return cart to store. Oh. <laughs> so you get in the parking lot. Right. Right. You're at, I'm at the end of the parking lot. And usually you'd put it in the, the cart bunk. <laughs> right. You got to return it to store. So they had you, know, you and then they the lost you. So um, close. They had, well, they had me and then they had me and then I'm like, oh my God. Anyway, um, the other little thing that they're doing, which is kind of interesting in their fresh stores, uh, which is their new, their grocery store con uh, concept is they're doing drive throughs which I guess, you know, my God, Sears did drive throughs 50 years ago. So, we, you know, they're not exactly innovating there, but in, in some way it's pretty interesting. Right? Well, when I read this story, there was part of me, which was, has nobody done drive-thrus at a grocery store yet? Because um, it does seem in some ways like a really obvious thing to try, particularly as we've seen more curbside pickup, buy online pickup in store, home delivery. Yep. So this idea that you could just drive through um, and pick up stuff as opposed to going into a parking space and waiting for somebody seems kind of obvious. Uh, I, I do know from talking to some people about this that logistically – it's like the McDonald's drive through right? If if you can go through there in a certain amount of time, it's great. Right. If you start to get delayed and it starts to get backed up, then everybody behind you is unhappy. Yeah. So I, I can see yeah. why maybe yeah. this isn't yeah. such an obvious thing to do. But again, it's I think Amazon's always experimenting with things right. and um, this convenience uh, aspect is becoming more and more important for lots of retail. And so I think this is just another another step in that evolution. Uh, well, let's talk about retail industry a little bit, particularly uh, the forecast for Q4, whether it was NRF or anybody who you wanted to ask was, you know, was was just a, a hockey stick, as we would say. It was very strong, very strong growth. But there's been a few uh, spanners in the works, so to speak. Uh, yeah. You've got supply chain challenges. You've got labor issues. Labor issues. I was talking to a retailer today and he said, where'd all the people go? Right. I don't get it. Like everybody can't find people. Where did they all go? <laughs> I, like at any level, you got it's, you know you, you got supply chain issues. As I said, you you've got COVID rearing its head, plus or minus mm -hmm. still, and probably for a while. Um, what do you think? Do you, would you would you think people are going to start resetting their expectations, or is are consumers on both sides of the border just going to be the Timex watch that keeps on ticking? What What do you think? I, I think this is probably the most difficult forecast kind of, I mean, not, I don't do formal forecasts, but to try to articulate what's going to ha be happening in the coming months. I think this is the hardest it's ever been. There's so many moving pieces. Mm -hmm. I think absolutely most consumer, the consumer overall is in really good, good shape. 
equity markets are good. You know, if you're in the market, you're feeling pretty, pretty wealthy, but you got a lot of things affecting consumer confidence. The supply chain issues just seem to be getting worse and worse. I mean, anecdotally, I've been hearing this. My older daughter sent me an email she got from, uh, I think it was Ann Taylor, Loft by Ann Taylor, basically saying, we don't know if we're going to have any product and we're sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so I mean, if you're being that proactive with customers, it wasn't even about holiday, like shop early. It was just like, Hey, we're sorry. We're doing the best we can, yeah, yeah, but we yeah. just can't get stuff. I think if you're, if you're already out yeah. there doing that, uh, as well as some of the other things we've, we've all heard, it's a pretty, it's a pretty scary time. So if you don't have the product, you can't sell it. Mm. And for most retail, unlike what we were talking about with RH, people aren't going to wait. Uh, they're going to go where they can get the product if they really need it. Um, the labor side is 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 crazy. Um, I, I just to tell one story. I placed a um, curbside pickup order with Crate and Barrel on Sunday, and I have done pickup from there a couple times before. And I was just I could easily go into the store and get it, but I was going to be really busy that day. I just wanted to pick it up. I still sure, haven't sure. gotten it, and. I mm. called the store, I chatted mm. online, and they said, basically, we are just overwhelmed with orders. We can't keep up. And I've seen this happen in a bunch of other places where, you know, restaurants where you plenty of tables, but they can't serve you because they don't have enough wait staff. So it, it, it is, it's clearly an issue affecting service levels, and it's got to be a barrier to, to spending. The only positive side in not having inventory is you don't have to mark down as much stuff. So I think the margins will be good, yeah. And the price inflation kind of makes the the sales number perhaps look a little bit better than it actually is when you look at unit volume. Uh, but it's a it's a crazy it's a crazy time. Even uh, you know, even if you had a crystal ball on where COVID was going to be over the next few months, just what we're walking into from a labor yeah. and supply chain side is really tough. Well, and there's another side of the supply uh, inventory. And again, talking to retailers this week, they said, listen, I got more inventory than I ever had in my life because I'm not just buying this order. I'm saying, okay, give me both orders because there's so much uncertainty in the supply chain that they're taking more risk on inventory. Right. So when it kind of the school of thought is if I can get it, get double because, you know, I think there's confidence that there's still buoyancy in the economy and demand side for many right. commodities, but the, the uncertainties in the supply chain. So literally retailers are running out of places to put stuff. And and if you think about holiday, for example, seasonal merchandise, the window really isn't, you know, the entire holiday season. People are buying their baubles and whatever in weeks. You know, it's very narrow. And yeah. and retailers, I think, are, are, are figuring, I'm just going to just, it, when I can get it, I'm going to get it. And therefore, I'll um, maybe have a step up against my competitors. Well, anyway, <laughs> let's keep a close eye on it. I'm, I'm glad we're weekly because I think it's going to change week to week. My goodness, you know, the news ebbs and flows week to week. So that's an advantage of our of our format. All right. Well, let's let's dip in to our episode. So last week we had a couple of great guests on Simeon and Ethan talking about everything from dead cat bounces to department store valuations to retail renaissance mm -hmm. department stores. Optimism, cynicism. We gave you a new name, Steve. You know, invest in cat bulldozers because that's where you think <laughs> B malls are going to wind up. Doctor uh, Doom bulldozed that's into me. the ground. Uh, Doctor Doom. So on that cheery note, <laughs> right. um, this is this is why I'm know, not a motivational let's, let's speaker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out of the business. You don't have a chance. Um, you know where where we think things are happening. So let's frame it in this episode. Again, it's just you and I, um, you know, the, a, the part, a bit of history, you know, tell us, a, take us up in a little bit of history, just to can bring everybody up to the same speed as you've seen department stores evolve, um, how they got into so much trouble in the before time. It's not like they were clean sailing and COVID kind of upset the cart. Um, what to make of the current big name strategies? Mm -hmm. uh, was there a bit of a renaissance, as I said, because people were doing one-stop shop and maybe that's going to continue. And then, and then really put your hat on for the long term and say, you know, if I was running, if you were running, if we were running a big department store, what are some of the decisions that we would be making? So why don't we start off with a little bit of the, how we got here first part of the, of the thinking of department stores. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to do too much of a history lesson, but I do think there are some things that might be useful for, for younger listeners, uh, but also just in terms of how retail has evolved. So if you think about the origins of department stores going back more than 100 years, 
department stores were really kind of this palace of consumption. The original department stores were primarily in the, in the big cities around the world, and they were the original everything store, particularly on the higher end. So they were, they were destinations. Uh, people would make special trips to go to the, you know, whether we're talking about Harrods or, you know, uh, the they flagship stores of Saks Fifth right? Avenue. They get dressed up too, right? Yeah. It, yeah. Right. It could be, I mean, Neiman Marcus, where some listeners will know I worked, there are a lot of stories about the original uh, Dallas store of people coming in from, you know, West Texas, Oklahoma, just to, you know, make a special visit. It was almost, you know, both tourist attraction as well as a place place to buy things. So there was a this sort of long history of mostly family run kind of iconic department stores in the major cities. And that was kind of the way it was for a long time. As cities grew up, then there were these family run department stores in the, this, you know, the the cities that became bigger cities, you know, Houston, whatever. Um, then yeah. really kind of post war was the growth of suburbia, at least in, in the US, but other markets as well and the birth of regional department stores. And so some of the names that we would all know, like Sears and Macy's, you know, they started to expand by building expansion versions of these stores in the suburbs, largely, or in some cities that they weren't in before. And the thing that I think was really interesting that is so much not the case anymore was they were kind of the, these sort of stores, Sears, Penny's, Macy's, um, Bonwit Teller, we can go kind of down the list of these iconic names. They were kind of the only place to go to get certain kind of merchandise, either everything in one place or certain brands. There really weren't a lot of choices. And as these malls got built, the malls themselves became this magnet. Um, so you had this period, 50s, 60s, 70s of enormous growth in regional malls and in the anchors uh, or in the brands that anchored them. Uh, so, you know, Sears was the biggest retailer on the planet, uh, but there were other brands that had huge market share, not only in the U.S., but Canada, U.K., et cetera. What started to happen was first, I would argue, 60s and 70s was the advent of the discount mass merchant off the mall. So mm -hmm. Walmart obviously being the most famous, but there were a lot of them. When I was growing up, we had Corvettes, EJ Corvettes, Caldor, Woolworth, you know, Kmart, Kresge, uh, Zares. I mean, there were a lot of these basically price-oriented general merchants that created a different format generally near the mall. In some cases, they went after markets where you could not support a big mall in the three or four anchors. And slowly, right. they started to gain share. And that started to cap a little bit of the growth of the regional malls and the regional uh, department stores. But the thing that really started to shift in the 80s and 90s were category killers. So Home Depot, mm -hmm. Best Buy, Bed Bath & Beyond, you know, you, you name it, there was a category-focused merchant of some sort that had a great assortment, low price, and more convenience because they were located off the mall, and you also started to have a bar, even a Barnes, even a Barnes and Noble, Barnes right? and Noble, even a, Barnes and Noble. I mean, you, there's specialty stores, um, you know, Williams Sonoma, J Crew, you know, all these different formats, some of which were located in the mall, uh, but the big hitters were largely located off the mall and these power centers, and so between dominant assortment generally lower price, easier access. You know, they started to pick away at the dominance of a lot of these department stores. And Sears, Penny's, Wards, you know, really started to get into trouble. The next wave, and this is where, you know, when we talk about department stores, they really peaked in the 90s. The department stores, depending upon a little bit how you classify them, have been losing market share since the late 1990s, at least in the U.S. And so, like I said, a lot of it was Walmart, Target, the discount mass merchants. Uh, a lot of it was category killers, specialty stores. It was sort of death by a thousand cuts. Everybody was trying to go after that. So no longer were they the only place or one of a few places. Now they were just one of many. 
places to go. And this is before the internet. Then the next, I think, phase in the, the downfall of the department stores or the challenges of the department store was the growth of off-price retailers. So the TJ Maxx, Ross, Marshalls, the, these kind of players, which really went after apparel and home fashions in a lot of cases, which were really, aside from Sears, which had a big appliance and electronics business, you know, the bread and butter of moderate department stores, apparel and home fashions, cosmetics. And so now you had all these off-price guys. Then you started to have the beauty, the Ultas, the Sephoras, you know, again, you know, picking off historically strong categories. So yeah. no longer are you the only place. Once again, you're now just more and more places trying to serve essentially the same type of customer or going after these merchandise categories. So even before e-commerce, there were just huge challenges in the department store business and in regional malls more broadly. Then you layer on top of that e-commerce. And this is when I think we really got this, this idea that I've talked about a lot of, of moderate department stores, at least, really being stuck in the middle because you had lots of value-oriented players where you get a lower price, more convenience, bigger assortments, et cetera, and maybe sacrifice some service and ambiance. You had other players on the higher end or more specialty end where much more focused assortment, more tailored customer service, nicer experience, maybe more convenient because it's closer to your house. You don't have to deal with the parking deck and two or three levels and everything. So uh, a, a lot of these things, again, continued to take away from that then and, and left these guys kind of in no man's land. As e-commerce started to become a bigger thing in these categories, you know, that was just another way to get outpriced, you know, be commoditized or um, yeah. have your lack of convenience be made made plain. So it's been a, a long ride, a long decline in the department store space. And I guess the question, and, and you know, we've also seen a huge number of store closings. I mean, Sears basically doesn't exist. Penny's, I think, has closed about yeah. 30% of their stores um, in the last five years. Macy's has closed a bunch of stores. Dillard's, not so many. So it, major contraction, yeah. long Kohl's. time. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we should probably mention Kohl's. You know, one of the things that's interesting about Kohl's is they were kind of the first player to pretty much go after the department store, you know, kind of mid-priced, everyday apparel kind of customer, but package it in a more mm. convenient way. So I think that, you know, there wasn't that much difference between what a Kohl's is doing in apparel and home fashions and some other categories and what Sears or JCPenney has been trying to do, but they've had better, more convenient real estate and oftentimes could kind of leverage the shopper who was hitting a bunch of places to pick up a bunch of things. I'll just run into Kohl's, just running, you know, running into the, the regional department store or the regional mall. It's not the same kind of, you know, get an errand done. It's more of an excursion. You know, I, it's a great, um, exploration of the history and speaking of history you know i work for hudson's bay which goes back to the 1600s for god's sakes as a as a, as a, a retailer lot of, so, a lot of years to get this you know right. you're surprised oh and then a lot of years to get it right and they're still trying god bless them um and you know they're buying and selling a couple of questions and some of this we've actually touched upon in prior seasons you know how did we get here like department stores like in lehman marcus sears you know, these were these were powerhouses filled with very smart people uh, who were running the businesses. And we've talked about, you know, crisis to make change. But, you know, as as it felt like department stores more watched things happen to them. Absolutely. Than tried to change. So how did how did they get so stuck in the middle that they couldn't see? I'll give you an example. You know, Sears was the place to go for for Craftsman Tools. What right. a great brand, right? Yep. Uh, Craftsman Tools were great tools too, right? And that was a big part of the section. Mm -hmm. Very savvy merchandising. The, the something for the fellas. Uh, great products. Uh, nice mix. Uh, but they they just lost it. I mean, the Home Depots or the Lowe's just right. took that all away from them. Uh, you know, they they just kind of felt like that. They they watched that happen to them. It's a long conversation and it's kind of maybe for another topic or maybe for listeners to go back a couple <laughs> of episodes. But in summary, how did we get here? Like, how did they get so stuck in the middle? Well, I think, number one, there was not a recognition on the part of a lot of these brands as to how important 
distribution strategy was that it was had a lot to do mm. with the real estate first that you know the 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 formats that were winning um were more focused on certain customers and were more convenient in a lot of respects and i and i and you know this is probably another episode because i've been thinking about this a lot but convenience is one of those mm -hmm. words that i think people throw around um but you know it can be convenient for me just to run in and run out very quickly right but it can also be convenient for me to go far and take a lot of time if it's really going to pay off. So I think RH we talked about, if, if you're interested in that sort of product and you're that sort of yeah. customer, it's convenient to go to RH because you're going to see everything you like and you trust them and yeah. it will pay off perhaps for you. You know, it's not the same as running into a convenient, you know, a convenience store. I, for I, Ikea the same way, right? Right. So I, yeah, yeah. I, I think there was a Ikea, misunderstanding. Ikea, the very same thing. Uh, of, uh, hmm. sure. Uh, which I think with, with moderate department stores, they had a little bit of everything for everybody, but they didn't realize how they were getting picked off by more focused competitors. And so this everything for everybody strategy was their Achilles heel. And then they tried to fix mm -hmm. their real estate and they were never going to be able to fix their real estate fundamentally. They had to be willing to compete with themselves. So arguing we had all the time at Sears. Uh, because the the even if you have strong brands and an interesting mix, you still have to give the customer a reason to come to the store or a reason to go to your your website. And the real estate has just been the Achilles heel. Now, some of it, not to get too inside baseball, there's a lot mm. of forces that kept Sears and others afloat because of the way regional malls work, where they're very dependent, as you know, on these deals that were yeah. forged years yeah. ago for the anchor tenants where they don't pay much rent, uh, but they have to operate. And so in Sears' case, I know, you know, we didn't pay rent at a lot of these places. And so we could break even in a store location, even though the economics of it were terrible. And so our decision was, well, do we go spend a bunch of capital and sign up for a bunch of rent to build that store that we could build across the street because long term that will give us a chance to save the business. But the dynamics of that, you know, the sort of some of it's cultural, but some of it is just the reality of the way people think about economics. But if you're starting with a clean sheet of paper, you would never build a Sears and you wouldn't, you know, nobody's building any more Macy's or JCPenney or Dillard stores, right? I mean, it's just a, it's just a format that doesn't make any sense. Um, so, so there's these forces that, that kept these retailers stuck basically in real estate that's, that has no chance of ever being, um, winning real estate, uh, but also kept them from investing off the mall, which was very obvious, um, what these people needed to do 20, 25 years ago. Yeah. Well, let's, let's cast our mind uh, it to, it, I mean, it's a big discussion, right? It's as big as a department store discussion, as big as a physical department store. But let's, let's cast our mind forward a little bit. So it's pretty clear that Amazon didn't bring death to department stores. So if anyone's listening and still thinks that, I think we can quickly dispel that. Um, but it, it is also the case that you're fairly pessimistic around the future of department stores and their ability to turn it around. Now, yes. we should also say that department stores have a spectrum as well. I mean, you know, you've got JCPenney all the way up to a Holt Renfrew or a Neiman Marcus and a Nordstrom's. Uh, so so we, we are batching them together. Um, how much is it tied? How much is their future tied to regional malls and malls? And how much is their ability to kind of branch out and, and be more innovative, like the Nordstrom local stores that kind right. of add a different pizzazz. So give me, give me a sense of a broad sense of your, your thoughts around turning this sure. fairly big ship around. Well, the first thing I, I would make a bit of a distinction when we talk about department stores between the moderate department stores and the higher end luxury department stores. Um, when right. we talk about Nordstrom's, Lehman, Sachs, Holt, Renfrew, Bloomingdale's, Number one, they have a stronger reason for being. They have more unique service model. Uh, they have more unique differentiated products. For the most part, they have very strong digital complements to what they're doing. And so I don't see them as being in the middle. Uh, you know, they're, they're more 
have a potential for a distinctive business um, model, uh, or they have a distinctive business model, their issue is really more that it's very mature. It's not so much about real estate. It's because mm-hmm. there's not a lot of growth potential for a bunch of reasons, which is probably a different episode. But when we talk about the moderate department stores, my question is, you know, if you look at the amount of real estate they have, the fixed costs they have to operate the business, they have to, at some point, whether we're talking about Macy's or Penny's or, or Dillard's, a few other regional ones, they have to grow the business. None of them have grown the business in 20 years, but, you know, underlying growth, none. Mm-hmm. And so the question is, if you believe that there, it's a slow slide to oblivion, unless they start to acquire new customers and grow the business with the customers they have, what needs to change to do that in a material way? And I can't work that out. Um, you know, it's great mm. to add some new products. It's great to update your stores. It's great to have curbside pickup. Yeah. But all of those things are not differentiators. Uh, the, the Penny's prototype store, that's not too far from me. They've got a coffee shop. Uh, you know, they've got some nice signing. Um, but for that store to work, they have to steal share from somebody else. And my question is, from whom and why? Other than price. Uh, the department stores have been pretty good at discounting to drive the business. They haven't been very good at winning loyal customers mm. at the scale they need to. So my fear is, like I said, I can't really work out what that would be that would make such a profound difference. And my fear is that what will happen is because, you know, if the last 20 years are any indication, despite lots of efforts, some of which I've worked on, (laughs) not much has changed. So the thing that has happened is they've closed stores. And the only thing we know about closing stores is that's not helping the customer. That is helping maybe your financial situation. But when I think about a Macy's or a Penny's, think about how many more TJ Maxx's, uh, Kohl's, Target's there are than these department stores. You can you have to drive by two or three of your competitors. So they are making themselves less convenient mm. by closing stores. Uh, they know We know that, that you don't make that business up online. And what is that compelling reason for a lot of customers to drive past all these other stores mm. I have closer to me that are frankly easier to get in and out of, probably have better prices, uh, or, you know, why don't I just order it on the internet? So I, I just, I can see some incremental things, you know, what I call the slightly better version of mediocre, but in terms of really a profound yeah. shift, I haven't heard anybody articulate anything that sounds like, okay, yes, that's going to really move the dial or that's something that, you know, none of these other competitors that have stole market share for 20, 30 years can't instantly replicate or, or replicate within six months or just discount to keep the customer. So I hate to be so pessimistic. I wish it were different, um, mm. but, I, but mm. I don't see, broadly speaking, a ton of hope. Well, let's, let's talk about hope. Um, I mean, I, when I think about department stores doing different things, I do think of Nordstrom as a great case yes. in terms of their local stores, building more presence than less, but at a smaller scale. I do think of an edge case like uh, Kohl's, who's taking returns back from Amazon. That they say, I mean, that's interesting. Um, and I do think of some department stores that would might counter your assertion that they can't make up the store closure by dot com sales. I mean, we're told kind of by testament that listen, you don't need as many stores because it's shifting to online. I think of. For example, I think of Hudson's Bay, they've got two stores in some towns where they really only need one. Yeah, arguably, they still have a presence in the city and they could arguably still do pretty well on on their online business. Is that a hope for the future, a, a smaller footprint and just really step on the gas of digital? Or you, you don't think that that's a way to, it's certainly not a competitive advantage versus others. Everybody yeah. can kind of do it. Well, you know, you, is that is that a path forward at least? I, I think you'd be, you have to be careful 
you know, it's a lot about focus. And I think the, the broader challenge with the moderate, mm-hmm. which is why, you know, I'm more optimistic about the Sachs and Neiman's and, and Nordstrom's of the world than right, JC right. Penney, um, because they are very much in the middle. And by consolidating space and hoping you can make it up online, you're, you don't have strong enough magnets to drive traffic to the website or to the store. You've got a lot of stuff that's pretty easy substitutes. So I think if you compare to say what, and, and I think Kohl's is definitely much stronger because they're not in regional malls. Um, you know, you have more differentiated product. We've seen Target add a lot of, you know, private brands, you know, those, those can be things that can give you differentiation both Idea. in the store as well as, as online. I think the, the hope for department stores, and I think ultimately we're only going to see one department store on the mall. I think we're going to, we're going to consolidate. And so as others go out, some of that market share will consolidate. But I think the strategy that has some chance of working is to invest in more kind of flagship, I'm using that term loosely, call them say magnet stores in an area which are really special, um, probably smaller than most of them. I was just to tell one story, I was uh, at a pretty good shopping mall here in Dallas over the weekend and a couple hundred stores used to have five anchors. They now have four because Sears went out. Um, there's a Dillard's, there's a Macy's, there's a JC Penney. They only need one. Th- those three stores are, are you know, practically identical and all of three of them are too big mm-hmm. for, for the business. So this is why I talk about the bulldozer business. Cause I mean, that, that mall itself should be a, probably at least a third smaller and the anchors have to really be reimagined. But, I, but I can see a scenario where you invest in, you know, particularly as competition falls away, something really special that happens to be on the mall. Then you have kind of a hub and spoke system. So whether that's the Nordstrom local kind of service center yep. that gives you uh, brand awareness, but sol- yep. you know, solves a particular purpose, not a, I'm going to a store to see stuff kind of purpose. Um, or potentially, you know, some of these more focused stores like Macy's is trying with their market by Macy's and their, their Bloomy store. I think the, the challenge of getting there from here is every Bloomy's or every market by Macy's you open, number one, takes some significant capital. It assumes you're going to win a, enough business away from the neighborhood competition you have. And that one location does maybe, if you're lucky, seven or eight million dollars. So if you're one of these big retailers and you're going to embark on this small store strategy, it takes a lot of time and a lot of capital to get that right. While your core business, you're closing stores and consolidating and maybe having to invest a ton of capital in those Mm -hmm. magnet locations. And my, my experience from Sears, when we I mean, that was essentially the strategy that we were going to embark on. We're going to open kind of a Kohl's-like store off the mall, some specialty stores, and migrate to a much smaller number of mall-based locations over time. The problem with that was the capital and the risk was enormous. And most of these companies that don't, I mean, I have to get too into like the capital market side of it, but, um, you know, Macy's ability to say, hey, you know, investors, Uh, We want to invest several billion dollars in this strategy over the next 10 years, and it's going to be pretty messy, and we're going to lose a bunch of money, but trust us, it's going to be amazing when we get done. You know, that that CEO, you know, say goodbye to Jeff Jeanette if that's what he's proposing, because no no board is going to sign up for that strategy. So, you know, again, it gets back kind of the earlier question, even if you've got a pretty good strategy, if you're tied to the malls and you've got these big, huge stores that you don't pay any money for. And now you basically have to re-up with a lot of capital in keeping some while spending a lot of capital to build out e-commerce and a bunch of other things. I mean, the economics of that are really, really challenging. And so I just, again, I, even if I had an idea, which I kind of do of what that would look like, it's such a capital intensive, long-term risky strategy. And Mm -hmm. You know, frankly, the things we're seeing right now from Macy's, you know, are pretty solid ideas. Um, they just should have been done 15 or 20 years ago because they're, you know, they, they run the risk of running out of runway um, to mount a turnaround and, and losing patience and, 
and just kind of starting a downward spiral in their core business. So again, do, I'm Dr. Doom on this, but um, you know, I, I would, I think Kohl's is much better positioned than just about any of the other moderate department store space. I think Macy's has got a little bit more life in them. I don't understand why Penny's exists. I don't understand why Dillard's exists. I don't understand why Belk exists. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can sort of insert your equivalents in whatever country you live in if you do, you don't happen to live in the United yeah. States or aren't familiar with the United States. Right. Well, I don't know. Like, you know, I'm, I, in some ways, I'm a little more sanguine about the opportunity to open many small stores from a strategic perspective, because then it raises your awareness to grow the dot com business. Like yes. I can get there in that line of thinking. Right. So I'm going to open, I got one big store, but I got seven little stores. And every time people drive by them, they're going, you know, the used to old marketing slogan for Hudson's Bay. It's hard not to think of the Bay. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I need to be thought of, like, I think sometimes these big department stores lose because people just, they, they fall out of the funnel. In other words, they fall out of the consideration set. I, um, I agree. And so I, may, I don't know, maybe there's, I've maybe. been a proponent, you know, I was a proponent of that sort of idea when I was at Sears, I was a proponent of that strategy at Neiman's, um, you know, mm. that those, those didn't work, work out, um, for various reasons, but I think that <laughs> too early you're, you're too way ahead I'm of always, your time. Always, maybe the issues you were just, I'm always way ahead. <laughs> you're way ahead of your I'm time. Always way ahead. If they would have done that 20, 30 years ago, I mean, really we've been in the dot com era, you know, 20, some years. I mean, that it feels like, as you said, a good strategy for 15 years ago. Have they run out of time? Yeah. And I would, you know, so I would look at, um, and it's not, you know, the only analogy, certainly. Um, I really love what Nordstrom is doing with Nordstrom Local. And I think, yeah. you know, again, yeah. you know, Nordstrom's a pretty mature business. There's some underlying you know, issues that, you know, and COVID is exacerbated because people aren't dressing up as much, et cetera. Going, uh, but there's a lot of things that Nordstrom not going to work in an office, yeah. does well. And, you know, for the most part, they've got their, their flagship stores in really good malls. And so that's not an issue of, of real estate, but I, I really like it. I think there is some, some potential life in this kind of hub and spoke system. I think the challenge, whether it's Nordstrom's, Macy's, pennies, anybody that might want to kind of embark on this flagship with, with a, um, satellite stores is it's not trivial. Uh, it's not a trivial investment. Uh, it's not trivial to find really good locations and not have to spend an enormous amount of money. It takes a fair amount of time. And maybe the bigger concern with some of these more traditional legacy retailers is, will Wall Street buy it? You know, will their board buy it? Mm -hmm. um, because it's it could look, it may be a great strategy, but it could look a little bit like a Hail Mary where, you know, trust us, we mm -hmm. haven't figured this out for 20 years, but now we're going <laughs> to open dozens, hundreds of these stores yeah. and spend a lot of money yeah, yeah. and it's all going to work out. So it doesn't mean it's not conceptually a good idea, uh, but I think there are a lot mm -hmm. of practical concerns with pulling it off. And, and, you know, it's not trivial to be trivial, so to speak. Uh, in other <laughs> words, if you want to, if, if you're going to move the me, needle, fact, you can't open. <laughs> yeah, I think it comes natural for both of us. But, but if you want to move the needle and you're Macy's, you're not opening five or seven of these. You're opening right. 100, 150. Right. And now we're into the billions of dollars. Now we're into the big bets. And yes. we're into the kind of career risking strategy. And, and uh, you know, I think I worry, I guess they worry to say, well, the market will go, hey, that could work out just fine. I'm going to move my money somewhere else and right. I'll come back in a couple of years if it works out or never come back again. So I, I kind of get what you're saying, that kind of whole aspect. Well, listen, it's been a great episode talking about department stores. I feel like there's a lot more we can talk about. Good thing we are weekly and we've got a whole season ahead of us. I mean, I, 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 we haven't even talked about Amazon's venture into department right. stores, which kind of leads us into naturally a discussion about what the heck is a department store anyway? Is that an mm -hmm. Ikea? Is that a this? Is that a this? So maybe that's good uh, folly or good uh, good topics to talk about and chew on, so to speak, right. uh, in future episodes. So for this episode, uh, let's let's wind it up uh, in terms of uh, we've talked about this part two. We're back next week. Uh, we get a great guest next week uh, back on the rails. And again, uh, call out to anyone listening on the podcast. We visit our YouTube channel. This entire episode actually is going to be up on our YouTube channel where you get to see you and I in person. Uh, and, and that's kind of, and how much fun is that? Um, I'm wearing a different shirt for anybody's following because I noticed I was wearing the same shirt in every episode. Um, 
I'm wearing a different so color shirts. of a different, of pretty much the same shirt than last episode, <laughs> yeah. I think. Well, uh, and I got, you know, different shade of black. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> listen, great episode. Uh, thanks for listening. And uh, everyone tune in to the next episodes and we'll catch you on the other side.